Aloha, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our talk story session with the lovely Olena Hugh. Uh, Ms. Anderson had thought it would be fitting to invite Ms. Olena to share her journey in her career and how her personal story has helped her live a life full of purpose. And now she is giving us a preview into what she does on a daily basis. Inspiring, inspiring the next generation of leaders like us in Management 120 class and others like yourself as it may apply to you personally. Everyone has been touched by the C word and she is here to share her personal story of being proactive and advocating for being the best version of you. Miss Olena has been influential in paving the way for others in her ability to bridge Hawaii people through her talk show, The Best Hawaii Series. Feel free to take a four by four card on the table as you exit or take a snack break. Without further ado, please welcome Miss Olena Hugh. Like many people, Olena Hugh's life has been touched by cancer. Her mother, grandmother, and aunt all had breast cancer. My mom passed away at home from metastatic breast cancer. And then they brought me in for more genetic testing and that's when I tested positive for the RAD50 genetic mutation. Uh, that means that I have a higher disposition for breast and ovarian cancer than other people. So when that happened, I decided that I wanted to remove my breasts. Based on the family history and some other factors, um, our different models showed that her risk of breast cancer in her lifetime was about 40%. So that was pretty significant. And for her, it was enough to pursue the bilateral mastectomy. I watched every single YouTube video I could find on mastectomy and on breast cancer and I started to interview other people in our community that were breast cancer survivors and reached out to as many people as I could so I could learn as much as possible about the process. When I had met Dr. Penn, I loved her demeanor, I loved um, just everything about her and there was something that made me feel comfortable. I trust her and she also went to Columbia. <laughs> So I thought, you know, Ivy League. <laughs> At Kaiser Permanente, we approach things as a team and that every step of the way, they're gonna have people taking care of them so that they're not alone. It's important and it's part of our job to show them that yes, they do have choices. With surgical prophylaxis, it decreases your risk by about 90%. I was very clear that I did not have cancer. It was preventative and I did it with the hopes of saving my life or prolonging my life. I didn't want to have reconstruction. I wanted to just bounce back and heal as quick as possible. It was unbelievable, the outpouring of support with people just saying words like brave and courageous. We've all been touched by breast cancer. In one way or another, we know someone, you are someone, and I may have done something that some might say is extreme, but I felt that it was something that I had to do to live a longer, healthier life. Our goal and our job is to really help navigate and make the decision that's right for them. And so what's right for one patient may not be right for another. And so when we get to the end of the treatment and the patient is happy, that means we've succeeded. So it makes me feel like we've done our job. I'm truly grateful to the Kaiser Permanente team for taking such great care of me. They did a wonderful job and I really appreciate them. The experience was wonderful. <laughs> Sorry, every time I watch it, I get like... <clears throat> oh. oh, thank you. <laughs> I've always been a crier anyway. <laughs> oh, but anyway, how's everybody feeling today? Gosh, it's Wednesday, it's hump day. Oh, thank you. Okay, yeah. Here you go. <laughs> Give me oh, some here. time to... <laughs> oh yeah, girls. Thank you. <laughs> the best one. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you all for being here today. Um, I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come and listen and hear a little bit about my story. Um, for some of you, you might recognize me or remember me. I used to be on TV. <laughs> and for others, you might not know who I am, but that's perfectly fine. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit more about me and where I came from and um, just, you know, my story. So um, I wanted to make this talk about living a life of purpose. And I wanted to also ask you, 
and just a few, you know, if you feel like sharing, what do you think your purpose is? You can just raise your hand. Don't be shy. You get extra credit. <laughs> Okay, to change this world around us. Anybody else? Someone over here. What is your purpose? Do you guys want to have a family? Or have a family or have children and raise them to be good people? Anybody else over here? Mm -hmm. And so hopefully after my story, you'll have a clearer vision of what my purpose is and maybe what yours is as well. So first of all, I was born and raised on the island of Kauai. Anybody from Kauai, by the way? Anybody ever been to Kauai? OK. <laughs> so um, I'm from the town of Kilauea, which is actually on the northern shore. Um, they have the beautiful white lighthouse with the red top. Um, and um, my mom was a single parent. She was from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm an only child. So even on my dad's side, he didn't have any children, and my mom didn't have any other children, so it's just me. Uh, I went to Kilauea Elementary School, and then I went to Kapa'a High School. I did not go to Kamehameha. Um, for some reason, my whole life, everybody <laughs> thinks I, went, I look like I went to Kamehameha schools, uh, but I did not. Um, and then I went to Hawaii Pacific University. So when I was in high school, I applied for many scholarships to pay for my college education, and I'm sure you guys you know, are going through that right now. And um, I received the Kauai Rotary Scholarship, and I also received the Kapa'a High School Foundation Scholarship, and then I ran for Miss Hawaii to pay for my college, because Hawaii Pacific University is a private education or um, institution, and um, I think at the time they were about $22,000 a year. And my mom didn't have a savings or anything for me to go to college. So I ran for Miss Hawaii to pay for that tuition. And so guess how many times I ran for Miss Hawaii before I won? Once. Not once. Five. Not five. A little bit less. <laughs> More than three. Four. Four. So when I was 17 years old, graduating from high school, I ran for Miss Garden Isle, and then I competed at Miss Hawaii, and I came in second runner-up. Then the next year, I went back to Kauai, and I won Miss Kauai, and I competed at Miss Hawaii again, and then I came in first runner-up. And then I was like, so close, right? So close. So even Robert Casimiro was like, girl, you got to run again. And I was like, ugh. So I decided to take a break, so I started working at Clear Channel Communications, which is now called iHeartMedia, or iHeartRadio. And I traveled, and I worked, I worked in promotions, I was on the air for a little bit on, it was called Hot 93.9, and then it was called I-94, and so I was on the radio station. <clears throat> and then I decided that I wanted to go back to school, so I competed for Miss Hawaii again. And then I came in second runner-up again. <laughs> And then one more time, as Miss West Oahu, I competed for Miss Hawaii, and then I won. And I won everything. I won interview, swimsuit, talent, evening gown, like clean sweep. So I went to the Miss America pageant, which was in Atlantic City. <clears throat> I think for something like 85 years, it was held in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And it was, it's a scholarship program. It's the largest provider of scholarship money for women in the world. So even though you might think pageant, oh, beauty queen, blah, blah, blah. It's actually more scholarship, scholastic, um, nonprofit, community service focused. And it's not the pageant that's affiliated with Miss Universe or Donald Trump. <clears throat> um, at the competition, I won the President's Volunteer Service Award. And I also won a non-finalist talent award. So coming back, I went back to school. Um, during my year of service as Miss Hawaii, I traveled all over the world. I went to Japan 13 times. Shanghai with the lieutenant governor, uh, Nebraska, Missouri, California, just all over the place. So I had to take a break from school. I decided to go back to school. And I, um, in my senior year of getting my bachelor's, I actually interned at KHNL. And this is before Hawaii News Now <clears throat> became the three stations in one. So I was interning at KHNL for my practicum. And that's when I realized like a light went off in my head like, oh, I was meant to do this. Like, I was meant to share great stories, to really, you know, impact people. 
and to be able to be in their homes on a daily basis, I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is what I was meant to do. So they said, oh, you know, you're a really good intern. <laughs> Why don't you try like audition or you know, test on camera? So they said, oh, we think you might be a good fit for the morning show. So I was like, okay. So I tested with three different male anchors and I was super nervous, like shaking. Like I couldn't, I was, had a really hard time just like speaking and they were like, oh yeah, you know, maybe do the weather. <laughs> and I was like, oh, like I really don't feel passionate about the weather, like nothing against the weather, like, and for other people that do the weather, but I was like, no, I wanna be a, a respected journalist. So I went to <clears throat> KGMB, which was about to launch a new morning show. And they're like, oh, nobody's ever going to hire you because you don't have any experience. And then I went to KHON, and KHON said, oh, we'll hire you. So I went to KHON, and I started as a general assignment reporter. And I also specialized in the police beat. So that means that I covered all the stabbings, murders, um, like anything that has to do with police. And so I worked on the 10 o'clock news with Joe Moore for one year. And then the general manager at KHON was like, we think you'd be great on the morning show. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, here we go again. But I had already been on camera for a year. I had the experience. I was you know, live reporting for the 10 o'clock news and getting my feet wet. So I tested and then they promoted me to morning show anchor. So we, Started this morning show, which is called Wake Up Today, seven years ago or so. And um, so that's me. <laughs> and then that was Jai, my co-anchor. And then, do you guys know Kirk Matthews? Yeah, he passed away recent, or a couple years ago, but Kirk was like, like the Joe Moore, you know, he was just a icon. And then Trini Kaupuiki, she just retired and is now heading up Make-A-Wish Foundation. And then Manolo Morales was pretty famous. He's a reporter, but he was super famous for his food segments. Every morning people would watch religiously. And so um, I co-anchored the morning show for seven years. I made it my goal to be an award-winning journalist. <laughs> and so I actually won a very prestigious award, which is called the Edward R. Murrow Award. And then I've won numerous Society of Professional Journalists awards. So essentially the reports that I did and the stories that I did were entered into um, contests and then it would win and so I, I got the awards. I was also employee of the year. Um, they sent me to Mexico <laughs> with my husband for winning employee of the year. I was the first ever actually employee of the year for KHON2. They had never had it before. And then I was um, Special Olympics Hawaii Media Person of the Year. I used to do a lot of fundraising for Special Olympics, going over the edge, polar plunge, all that kind of stuff. So super active. <clears throat> I got married um, a few years into my journalism career. Um, my husband's name is Daniel Hugh. And my um, maiden name was Ruben. So a lot of people knew me as Elena Ruben. And then when I changed it to Elena Hugh, they were like, why'd you change your name? <laughs> I was like, because I got married. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. Um, and then if I wasn't busy enough anchoring the morning show and reporting and working 13 hour days a week, I decided that I was wanting to get my master's. <laughs> so I went back to HPU. I received the Hawaii Association of Broadcasters scholarship. And I, I studied for two years while working full time. And I wrote a thesis uh, that studied the impact of social media on television journalists. So my master's thesis was 157 pages long. Yeah, grad school. <laughs> uh, while I was working on the news, um, I started to see a shift in the content that we were doing. Um, they started to enact something called accountability journalism. And if you are an avid news watcher, you've probably seen it over the past few years. I call it sensationalizing. <laughs> but. Um, I couldn't tell the stories that I wanted to tell. I couldn't interview a boy that was dying of a brain tumor. It was, why is he getting the brain tumor? How did he get the brain tumor? Who's accountable for the brain tumor? And so I decided that I wanted to still do the things that I wanted to write about and talk about, so I started my own blog. And it's my point of view, because of my last name. Um, and so that was fun, I started writing my blog. And then I felt as if I wasn't living a positive life in the news. 
um, it just wasn't a very nurturing place to be and a lot of things had changed. So I had talked to my husband and I told him, you know, I'm not happy doing what I'm doing. I didn't feel fulfilled and I just decided to quit. So I, um, I started my own business and I called it Olana Hugh Communications. And because I had so much experience with social media and I loved planning events and doing marketing type things, I just took everything that I was doing already and I turned it into my own company. Is anybody studying business? Oh, okay. So I didn't. <laughs> I studied speech and communication. And um, so when I signed up my business, I created it as a sole proprietor, which I thought was like the easiest thing to do. And then I realized later that you should create a LLC. <laughs> See, I didn't know that. <laughs> but um, so what I ended up doing was I, um, I was a little bored because I had a little bit of a hard time getting clients. You know, when you first start out, getting the word out. I had um, one client that was a pet shop and I volunteered to do their social media and then that was my first client. And then I had thing, you know, places like the Hilton and grew and grew, but when it would get slow, I was kind of bored and then I thought, oh, I'm gonna start like a hiking club for women and it's gonna be like an empowerment thing. So I said, oh, what am I gonna name it? I'm gonna name it Lily Koi Ladies. Yeah, cause you know, the Lily Koi blossom is so beautiful and rare and the Lily Koi is kind of tart, but it can be sweet, like us ladies, right? You know, <laughs> kind of rare. <laughs> and so I, I registered Lily Koi Ladies and then I got super busy again. And then when I realized I should convert my sole proprietorship, I just moved everything into the LLC. So now Lily Koi Ladies is my umbrella for everything that I do, so for business people. I'm glad you guys know what you're doing. <laughs> so yeah, so I do content, branding, digital marketing, websites. I do a lot of freelance writing. I write for a lot of blogs, um, news websites, hawaii.com. I write for magazines, High Luxury Magazine, Aulani Magazine, um, The Hilton Magazine. So that keeps me super busy. Uh, two years ago, I decided that I wanted to do another TV show. And I was on KATV for a minute, <laughs> and then things didn't work out, and then I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do my own show. And so I came up with an idea while I was stranded in New Zealand, because I couldn't get on a flight, I was flying standby, and I had to sleep over in the New Zealand airport. And that night, as we were waiting for the flight the next day, came up with the concept of a new show called The Best Hawaii because I felt that everybody likes the best of, right? You want to know where's the best plate lunch, you want to know who has the best shave ice. And so I came up with this concept, and the best Hawaii is to highlight the best in culture, cuisine, and crafts of Hawaii and beyond. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just going to reach out to people, and I'm going to film it with my phone, and just see what happens. So I reached out to Rainbow Drive-In, I reached out to Latour Cafe, Coco Head Cafe and I started doing the interviews and publishing it. I ran into someone that I used to intern for. He started working at Hawaiian Telecom and he said, oh, Hawaiian Telecom's launching their new video on demand channel. You know, we're interested. And I said, oh, great. So Hawaiian Telecom picked up the show ever since. And so it's been streaming on their network. Um, and then I was like, I want to get it on an airplane <laughs> because I felt like it was perfect content for visitors. So I emailed Hawaiian Airlines, I emailed Japan Airlines, I emailed ANA, and I emailed Alaska Airlines. And I actually personally know the person at Alaska Airlines. And wasn't really getting a response, but I really wanted it on Hawaiian Airlines. I was like, Hawaiian Airlines is like the perfect, you know, in flight. So I email again, no response. Email again, oh, you know, we're interested, we'll get back to you. Oh. And then, you know in Hawaii, like our Asian culture, like. We're not that pushy, right? You know, you just kind of, oh, okay. But I was like, oh, no, I really, really want it on Hawaiian Airlines. <laughs> so January 2019, I emailed Hawaiian Airlines one more time. And I said, I'm sorry. I don't mean to keep pestering you, but I've made it my goal in 2019 to get this show on an airplane. And January 21st, they said yes. So it's been streaming on Hawaiian Airlines for a little over a year now. And it's been wonderful. I'm so happy. Every time I fly, I watch it. So if you fly on Hawaiian Airlines, just watch it. And if you watched it already, just watch it again. Or, like, or just let it go. Because <laughs> it does help me. <laughs> uh, but so that's been wonderful. Uh, I write for Hawaii.com as well. And I have a, a 
media partnership with them, so they also share the content that I produce. And then the Honolulu Star Advertiser started um, a few year, years ago their Hawaii's Best Awards. You might see it in the paper and people with the sticker that say, you know, Hawaii's Best whatever. So we've actually partnered where I produce videos that showcase the winners. So it's a little confusing because I have my own The Best Hawaii, and then there's also the Hawaii's Best winners. But um, so I'm kind of like contracted by the Star Advertiser to produce those segments for them as well. So last week, Friday, I was on the Big Island. They had a winner in Hilo and another winner in Kona. And they're like, are you cool with us you know, flying you to the Big Island and then you driving? <laughs> and I was like, oh, OK. So I did it. I flew over. I filmed the segment in Hilo. And then I drove two hours over Saddle Road and then went to Kona to go film the second one. So that's been a lot of fun. And then so as you saw in the video, um, when I was in high school, my mom's sister, so my aunt, um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And it was very quick, very rapid. It had spread, and she had passed away. So that was the first time I heard about breast cancer. And I remember my mom being overcome and overwhelmed with emotions you know, to lose a sibling. And I didn't really understand how hard it was for her, because at the time I was a teenager. But I just remember it was just very traumatic. Fast forward a few years, I'm working at KHON, and I get a call. My grandma was undergoing radiation. She also had breast cancer. And so she was um, in Florida, so there wasn't very much I could do. But you know, I, again, breast cancer pops up. And then um, a few years after that, my mom told me that she had breast cancer as well. So obviously, it's like, oh no, like this is very prevalent. So she battled the disease for three years. Um, she would drive herself from Kilauea to Wilcox Hospital, which is over an hour away for treatment, and drive herself back and forth. And then on, in April 2018, um, it had nothing to do with it, but during the flooding, the tragic flooding on Kauai, she had actually passed away at home alone. And so I was left to really, really pick up the pieces as an only child and single parent. I went back, and so she had two young dogs and a little bit of a hoarding problem, <laughs> um, of which we had to get those large roll-off containers to clean out the house. I needed three of them. And so in the midst of all of that, um, they had me on a very high accelerated breast cancer detection plan. And so every six months, I would alternate mammogram and breast MRI. And so one month after my mom passed, my mammogram popped up. And I was like, oh, you know, of course. So I go, I fly over to Honolulu, and I had my mammogram. And I kind of thought that maybe there was some, like a lump or something in my left breast. But we weren't really too sure. And then sure enough, they said, oh, we, we think we found there's something. Um, I was hiking at the time, and then Kaiser called. And I was like, they never call, you know? And I was like, oh. They called, and they said, oh, we got to bring you in for more testing. So I went in for more testing, another mammogram, a 3D ultrasound. And they said, it's benign. It's not cancer. So I said, oh, OK. They said, oh, but we're going to bring you in for more genetic testing. And so essentially, you know, our body is made of genes, right? You, you're made of DNA. And over time, sometimes those genes mutate. And so they brought me in for genetic testing. It's pretty simple. You just give blood. And then a month later, I got a call. And I said, oh, yeah, you tested positive for a genetic mutation. It's a newer genetic mutation, but recent studies have shown that it shows a higher risk of breast cancer. And so with my aunt, my mom, and my grandmother all having breast cancer, and then now I tested positive for this genetic mutation, I just said, I want to remove my breasts. So I talked to my husband about it, and he was 200% supportive. And I'm really active. I'm a water baby. I hike. Um, I'm just very, very busy. And I did a lot of research, and I tried to figure out you know, what the process was of having a mastectomy. And there's several options in terms of reconstruction. You can remove the breast. You can have implants put in. Um, you can do a flap surgery, which means you take the tissue from your back and put it into the breast pocket, and then it kind of turns into a breast. Um, there's all these other things, like taking the fat from your butt and putting it in your chest, which they said I didn't qualify for. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but uh, I, I felt pretty strongly that I didn't want to have reconstruction. 
Um, I had never had a surgery before. I'd never broken a bone. And I wanted to just be able to have the surgery, sew it up, recover. It would take at least three months to recover and then just jump back into life. So I opted not to have implants or anything put in. And I just healed. So my mom passed away in April. In May is when they found the lump, which was not cancer. Uh, and then in April 10th, 2019, I removed my breasts. And then in July 2019, I got cleared to go in the ocean. So yeah, so that's pretty much been the, the timeline of my life so far. So had you guys heard of mastectomy before? Some people say mastectomy, they don't say the T, but mastectomy means the removal of the breast tissue. And so for me, I had a bilateral mastectomy. What does bilateral mean? Two, right, by two. So I had two, both of the breasts removed. It's actually a simple bilateral mastectomy, which means um, removal of the breasts. Uh, they couldn't save the nipple, so no nipple sparing, and then just sew it up. So that's technically the term. You guys are in college, so it's, I feel like I can tell you these things. Um, as you heard in the video, having the surgery reduced my risk of breast cancer by over 90%. It's not 100% simply because they can't guarantee that they got all of the cells out. You know, they go in, they open it up, they take out the tissue, they try to scrape out the cells from within the body, but there's not 100% that they got all the tissue. Um, and so with a breast cancer abnormality, um, like BRCA1 and 2, which you might have heard of, you would see a risk of breast cancer 45 to 65%. So women with an abnormality, yes? Mm -hmm. So for me, it wasn't an option because I had large breasts. So I think because the nipple would be so far from the heart or from the blood source, if I had smaller breasts, then they could do what they call nipple sparing. Yeah, yeah. So. I had two doctors say that nipple sparing wasn't an option, and then I had another doctor say that it was, but then it sounded like it was really hard. And I'd, I'd watched some videos, and it does seem a little challenging to keep that tissue and those cells alive. So, yeah. Um, oh, so essentially, just generically, one out of eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. So, and don't forget men, you can get breast cancer too. It has happened. So with that, um, <clears throat> when I first decided to remove my breasts, I was gonna keep it private because that's kind of like a, a very personal private thing. And then my husband said like, are you gonna document this? Are you gonna share your story? And I was like, I don't know, should I? And my husband's like kinda anti-social media. Like, <laughs> He's not, like he has an Instagram, but like he hardly ever posts and he's just not really into it. But he said, I think that you should share because I think that you would help a lot of people. So I don't know if you remember the video that you saw earlier, but at the end before I was crying, I looked like I was crying and I waved. Um, that was the first video I did. That was the day before my surgery. So I still had my breasts and I, I was crying because I was like, this is the last day with my boobs. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so after that I, I documented every day the day before my surgery, the morning of my surgery, coming out of surgery, and then the, the process thereafter, the recovery. Um, I haven't done anything with those videos yet because I wasn't ready. Um, some people said, oh, you know, October's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, maybe you should release the videos, and then I thought about it, but then I, I just wasn't ready. Uh, so anyway, I wrote about it on my blog in, was it July? I think it was July. Um, and so my blog is just, talking about like why I did it, what happened, you know. And then after that, it just went viral. Like I was on the news, I was on radio stations, like everybody, like 200% positive. Like everyone was just, you're so brave, you're so courageous, you're so inspiring. And I would get all emotional because I didn't feel like I was being brave. I didn't feel like I was inspiring anybody. I was just doing what I thought I should do, you know, to, to live my life. So that was amazing. Um, I'm actually gonna be on the news tomorrow. <laughs> I'm gonna be on Sunrise um, because I'm receiving an award on Saturday. 
um, Susan G. Komen selected me to win an award of courage. And so it's gonna be given to me at the pink tie ball. And um, I hope I can keep it together. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's pretty much, that's an honor for me in this process, in this journey. Oh, I was also featured in midweek last week. Um, and so after all of this happened, I felt like my life, a lot of people would call me the Miss Hawaii, like, oh, you were the Miss Hawaii. And then after that, when I was on the news, they're like, oh, you're the news lady. And now I didn't really know who I was and like who I'm supposed to be and like what my purpose is. And so I did a lot of introspection and I just felt like, I think my sole purpose is ultimately to impact the lives of other people and to encourage you to be comfortable in your own skin and to seek out help if you need help and to also you know, live a positive, nurturing life. If you aren't happy what you're doing, then change it. If you're thinking negative thoughts or if something is bothering you, flip it, you know, make it positive. Um, you can't spend all that time being negative or being unhappy. For me, that was a priority of my life, was to live a, a positive and a happy life and to hopefully share that with other people. You can be strong and you can do what makes you happy. So I, I, I do feel like these are some of the things that help me in this journey to inspire people, to aspire to do great things, um, to also reflect and have gratitude. You know, wake up every morning and say like, oh, I'm grateful, I, I have a house, I have food, I have a husband that loves and cares for me. Um, you know, I may not have any family, but it's, I have his family now. So um, if I can leave you with any parting words, it's also to remain positive, to think positive. Always set goals for yourself. You know, it might have seemed kind of crazy to run for Miss Hawaii <laughs> four times, but each time that I ran, I got college tuition to HPU and college scholarship and I graduated with my undergrad with no student loans. So that was you know, a big thing for me, not to burden anybody else. I was the only one looking out for myself and I had to put myself through school and that's what I did. Um, and then obviously you know, working my way through the news and, and then being an anchor, but then noticing that it wasn't a purposeful part of my life anymore and then deciding to change it, so taking action. So yeah, believe in yourself, do what brings you happiness, and live a life of purpose. Yeah. Well, I feel really great. I feel like thank you so much for paying attention and listening and <laughs> asking questions. And hopefully you feel inspired or you felt like you learned something. And um, if you want to, you can always reach out. I'm on all social media at Olena Hugh. And, um, I'll try to get back to you. But if you have a question or you just want to say something, I'm always available, truly. So, oh. Well, everybody, if we can give Miss Elena a hand for coming out today and stuff. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming out, talking to us, the staff, the students, the faculty here. We really appreciate it and sharing your message and stuff and spending this last hour and a half or however long it's been with us. So we really appreciate it and we thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Everybody, Miss Elena Hughes.